Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about several related technologies that are having an increasingly powerful impact. When we combine artificial intelligence, robotics, and drones, we get machines that can travel almost anywhere to carry out almost any task in an intelligent way. The merging of these technologies opens up enormous possibilities, but also some very real risks. We're going to discuss these technologies, the benefits and the risks, with my guest, Steve Omohundro. Steve has been a scientist, professor, author, software architect, and entrepreneur, doing research that explores the interface between mind and matter. He co-founded the Center for Complex Systems Research at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. He published the book Geometric Perturbation Theory in Physics, designed the programming languages Starlisp and Sather, and is president of Self-Aware Systems, a think tank that works to ensure that intelligent technologies have a positive impact. He also serves on several advisory boards, including the Cryptocurrency Research Group and the Institute for Blockchain Studies. And we may talk a little bit about Bitcoin if time allows. Steve, welcome to the program. Oh, thanks, Marty. Steve, what would you say is the most interesting development taking place in artificial intelligence right now? I'd say it's economic impact. In 2014, every major tech company, including Google, Apple, Microsoft, Baidu, invested multi-billion dollar investments in AI and robotics. And so that's a sign that we're on the verge of a much bigger impact on society. Now, what are some of the main things that this AI can accomplish now? Well, there was a study by McKinsey that argues that over the next 10 years, by 2025, there'll be $50 trillion of value that these technologies will add. The area, primary areas are manufacturing robots, uh, applications in medicine, uh, automating a lot of business processes, automated cars, self-driving cars is a big area, and then there are a lot of military applications as well. So we're talking about uniting artificial intelligence with machines, with robots, so we have machines that are mobile and can actually think to some degree. Uh, are they really thinking? Do computers really think, or is this just a simulation of intelligence? Well, people often make a distinction between what they sometimes call narrow AI and general AI. And today, all the systems are pretty much narrow AI. So Siri can understand your voice. That's something which was a research problem until 10, 15 years ago, and now it's pretty good. Um, all these systems are gradually getting smarter and smarter. None of the systems that are actually in, deployed today are all that smart. But in labs, uh, systems are getting smarter at an unbelievably rapid rate. I understand that there's a lot of work being done already in robotic manufacturing. In fact, I think we have a slide about that uh, showing some of the things that can be accomplished. Do we have that slide? Robotic manufacturing. Okay, well, it should be coming up pretty soon. Yeah, huge, huge area. Uh, China is actually one of the leaders in that area. There are 420 Chinese robot manufacturing companies. And so they're making a lot of robots and they're starting to use them. One very interesting example is Foxconn. It's a Taiwanese company that makes 40% of all consumer electronics, including the iPhone, the iPad, the Xbox. Lots and almost many of the, the devices that we all use are made in this factory. Today they have about 1.3 million people doing that manufacturing, but it's not very pleasant work, you know, rep very repetitive. And a few years back, Apple got a lot of flack because some of these employees of Foxconn were committing suicide, jumping out of the window. And at that time, the president of Foxconn said he was going to buy a million robots. And uh, they haven't done that yet, but they're, they're bringing in about 30,000 robots a year right now. Well, now the employees might have an even bigger reason to jump out windows if they have no jobs at all. Yeah, that's a big issue. And so the whole issue of automation of jobs and what is the, the balance between automated systems and humans, I think is a big, big issue lots of people are thinking about. Well, repetitive tasks like automobile assembly, uh, most big automakers use a lot of robots on the lines. They're faster, they're more precise, they're more accurate, they don't go on strike, they don't demand higher wages, they don't take coffee breaks. How can humans compete with that? I would say any job that a robot can do is probably a job that you don't want to do. And my current vision is if you don't want your job to be repl you know, re replaced by a robot, you should do something that um, people want to hire you for. You should really add value to other people in life. 
and that I would say, let's let the robots do the jobs that are repetitive and mechanical, and let's let people do the things that people are good at and love to do. Although I think that many people are happy to do repetitive and mechanical jobs, so long as they provide a nice paycheck. Yeah. So one of the issues that there's a lot of discussion on these days is these new technologies are going to provide huge increases in productivity. Um, how is that value that's being created, how will that be distributed among the human race? Will it all be concentrated in a few very wealthy hands, or will it contribute to the uplifting of all people? And what do you think is the more likely case? I don't know, that's a political question, and mm. I think, I think there, there are already starting to be battles uh, along those lines. Uh, my own personal help would, uh, hope would be that uh, I think we're gonna have so much productivity that it will not be a very big drain on the worldwide economy to ensure that every human has enough to you know, eat, drink, uh, good education and good health care. And that on top of that, there's an opportunity for tremendous uh, individual contribution and you know, people become wealthy on top of that. Now some robots are getting pretty sophisticated. They're being used to perform surgery. In fact, I think we have a slide of that. So we have robotic surgery where the robot cuts you open. So there it is. Now, are these robots essentially puppets where there's a guy manipulating the controls and determining every move? Or do these robots decide where to make the incision? Well, I mean, the initial systems were things that helped and assisted the, the human surgeon, uh, particularly in brain surgery, getting the exact precise positioning is very important. The um, robot... Uh, surgeons were able to align with MRI data about exactly where the brain is and where they are. I recently saw a talk of a company that is making hair replacement uh, robots. Um, in hair replacement, you take little you know, plugs well, of hair from down here and you put them on the top. Very, very tedious, repetitive, hundreds and hundreds of little teeny surgeries. Human surgeons get very uh, tired and fatigued after three hours of this. The robot surgeon, once, once it knows the structure of the head and where everything is, it just goes for hours with, it with you know, never gets tired. Now, I understand that artificial intelligence is also getting better at diagnosing human ailments, talking about medicine. Uh, your iPad might be able to take a picture of your face and determine if you have high blood pressure. Yeah, that's a huge area these days, both in the sort of diagnostic end, lots and lots of new devices, you know, one drop of blood and they can run hundreds of tests, or even do you know, DNA sequencing is a big thing. Uh, and then on the end of, there are now AI systems which are scouring the literature for new uh, health results, correlations. Oh, if you've got this symptom, that probably means you have this disease. And you know, doing data mining on all of that data and making much better diagnosis than typical human doctors can. So is this what's called big data, where you gather data from many different sources, which normally would be hard to see the connections between them, but now with computers, it can pull it all together and you say, hey, there's a pattern here. Exactly. Yeah, we're making all kinds of progress with that. Another area of robotics is driverless cars, a car that drives itself. The only thing the car doesn't decide is what the destination is. You have to tell it that but it decides what lane to go in, where to turn, it determines the route. So what's how complicated a problem is that uh, to make a car drive itself? Well, you know, if you ask somebody 10, 15 years ago, they would have said, oh my God, a car that drives itself, that's probably the full AI problem. It has to recognize, you know, what's going on in the street. Turns out probably the leader in that area right now is Google. They have uh, cars that have driven over a million miles. Uh, there have been a number of accidents which have been in the press recently, but all of the accidents so far have been caused by human drivers, you know, like maybe being so amazed by these cars that they, they slam into them. I think we have a slide of one of the Google cars. Can we see that, please? Yeah, this is their new car that uh, is meant to look very friendly. Um, and, uh, it looks it's, harmless. There it is. It looks uh, not very threatening. Yeah, almost a little bit like a toy car, mm -hmm. and I think it's limited in how fast it can go. I think for the initial launch where people are starting to use it, you know, the first driverless car that kills somebody is going to generate a lot of controversy. And so I think they want to be very conservative in how they bring this technology forward. But the potential impact is huge. There's something like, you know, a million people involved in various aspects of the car industry that could potentially be affected by this technology. Now, some people are saying that in the future, humans won't be allowed to drive because their reflexes are too slow and they don't have 360 degree vision. Only a computer is smart enough to drive your car. Well, and also the uh, autonomous cars have the potential of talking to one another. So if there's an accident up ahead, the car can know about it long in advance. Or if there's a pothole in the road, uh, the car can know about it and prepare for it. And so 
uh, the, the sharing of information is another way to make sure that they're much more safe than human What drivers. about millions of people who drive for a living, all the truck drivers, because it would be easy to uh, send uh, driverless trucks out? Yeah, huge area. Again, that's one of the areas of where automation is going to change the nature of a lot of jobs. Um, Semi-drivers, apparently that's also not a very pleasant job that, um, you know, a little bit of driving is fun, but hours and hours and hours on the road, people get tired, they get fatigued. There's a lot of issues of accidents coming yeah. from that. Well, some people seem to like it because some people like to be away from everything and just on the road by themselves. So we're talking about millions of people who, what about companies like uh, Uber, this uh, taxi system where any private individual without going through all the licensing requirements becomes a taxi driver with his own car. Yeah, now, Uber is having a huge impact already um, disintermediating the taxi companies. Uh, it's worth $50 billion at last count, and it's a phone app. And so that's kind of amazing. Right now, Uber makes their money by taking 20% of the commission, roughly. Um, but they see the writing on the wall. If, if, it's, if it's $50 billion for a phone app, lots of people are going to make this kind of phone app. And Google announced they're going to make their own kind of Uber-like thing. So then Uber announced, well, they're going to do their own self-driving cars. And they hired essentially the entire Carnegie Mellon robotics lab. And they set up an autonomous vehicle lab out in Pittsburgh. And so I think, and every car company now is also talking about doing autonomous cars. So we're going to see a lot of energy in that area. I heard that Tesla's planning on having driverless cars in just a couple of years. Yeah, they've said that by a software upgrade, they can get their cars to be 90% autonomous. Now, what about people who love to drive? They love the thrill of controlling the car, doesn't that? And that's the reason why people buy a Tesla, because it's so much fun to drive, but if you're just sitting as a passenger, where's the fun? Yeah, that's a good question. There may be special parks where you get to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, race it yourself. Um, cars as we know them, if they do become autonomous, um, you may be able to work in there, you might be able to sleep in the car, you, you know, uh, the interiors may look very different than they do today. Now, robots animated by artificial intelligence are very powerful things, but what happens when we give the robots the ability to fly as well, like drones, that's a whole other thing altogether, intelligent flying machines. What are, what are some, like right now, we know you can go to a store like Fry's and buy a drone as a hobbyist for maybe $100 or so. But where is that going? Well, I mean, that has, uh, as with all of these things, it has very positive, amazing uses. Um, drones are being used to photograph things. A lot of uh, agriculture uh, farmers are using drones to inspect their fields, and they can use way less herbicide because they can see right when some you know, something bad happens where they need to apply it. So. Huge, huge positive impact there, looking for forest fires, that kind of thing. People are also using them to spy on people. A uh, lot of military uses. Uh, mi military drones have become a huge, huge thing. Every country on the planet, pretty much, is developing their own drones. In and fact, I think we have a slide of a military drone. Could we see that slide, please? Okay, so there it is. Uh, so that uh, aircraft at the top, that's the drone, and that missile underneath it is a missile just released by the drone, and it looks like there are some more missiles you know, ready to be launched. So, so this is changing the face of warfare in a significant way because a human pilot takes up a certain amount of space and you don't want to lose them. With a drone, you don't have to have an ejection system. Yeah, exactly. Though I have heard that uh, often the you know, U.S. is using drones quite a bit in, in the Middle East and there are human pilots here in America who are guiding these drones. Apparently that's a pretty high stress job. And so they're having some issues with the psychology of the people that fly those drones. That's one of the forces that may push them to become more autonomous. Even though they're thousands of miles from the action. Yeah, they still are seeing what they're doing and they're making the decision when to blow something up. And mm -hmm. well, that's a pretty stressful thing. Because if they're going after somebody in Al-Qaeda or ISIS, they might say, well, we have them in our sights, but there's a bunch of civilians around them, so maybe we should hold our fire and try again at another time. Exactly. Or and that, maybe not, as the case may be. And so if you automate that function, now all of a sudden you're going to have a software program, an AI program, making that kind of decision. Mm -hmm. And that brings up all sorts of ethical issues. Uh, in Europe right now, there's a big movement to try and stop uh, you know, killer robots, is the, the phrase that people are using. Well, drones are very powerful things. The problem is... Anybody can get them. If we can do it to somebody else, they can do it to us quickly and easily and cheaply. 
So almost anybody can buy a drone as a hobbyist, outfit it with a little payload, and just fly it through somebody's window who they don't like. And it's very hard to defend against that. A drone uh, landed on the White House grounds a few months ago. The White House no, has no defense against that, at least it didn't a few months ago. Yeah, that's a huge issue. And in fact, just a few days ago, a teenager uh, built himself a drone with a handgun on it and was able to remotely fire this handgun, Put the, you know, took a video of it, posted it on YouTube, and petrified many, many yeah. people looking at that and video. And there was nothing illegal because it was on private property, wasn't threatening anybody. Yeah, but I think that's a harbinger of what will be coming. And one of the responses to that is anti-drones. And so drone, anti-drone warfare, I think, mm -hmm. is something that we, we're really uh, on the verge of. Another interesting thing about drones is that they can come in many different sizes. You have very large drones that can carry missiles, drones that are the size of uh, good-sized aircraft, and then you have drones that are the size of mosquitoes. Yeah. What, what, what use can you make of a drone the size of a mosquito? Military is developing a number of very teeny, teeny drones, some of them quite expensive. That mosquito-sized drone is about $40,000. Um, it's primarily for surveillance at the moment. Um, if a branch of the military is going into a town or something, they'll send a fleet, uh, a swarm of these little mosquito drones to go check it out. They get the video feedback and they know what's up ahead. Is there any chance that these small drones will at some point become self-replicating? In other words, drones can make more drones like themselves, which would reduce the cost to next to nothing. And they, you could have huge swarms of these things and just send them out over a battlefield. They could uh, smell the enemy's blood and deliver a fatal sting. And well, you don't even see it coming. Yeah, so self-replication is a pretty difficult and challenging thing, so I wouldn't uh, expect that in the near future. But 3D printed drones, uh, that's already a thing. People are starting to make many of the key components. And so the cost of manufacturing large numbers of drones is going way, way down. And uh, I know the US military is working on drone swarms, groups of drones that co uh, coordinate with one another as they fly around. There are also swarm boats. Uh, the Navy has developed a, a set of boats that surround, say, a pirate. You know, if a, if a pirate is coming toward a, a large ship, uh, they can send out these uh, swarm boats to kind of uh, intercept them. Now what about normal everyday practical uses for people like us? I mean, aside from the fact that Amazon might be able to deliver your order via a drone, I mean, how will we make use of it? Well, you know, the delivery for uh, orders, I think, is a bit of a PR stunt right. because it's pretty expensive energetically to fly something there. For something where the timing is really important, a few uses I've heard are bringing uh, medicine to somebody who's sick. You know, let's say you've just been stung by a bee and you're allergic to a bee sting. You know, get the medicine. getting the medicine there really quickly is important. Or a defibrillator, or getting a, a life, um, you know, a lifesaver to somebody who's drowning out in the ocean. All of those are great, great uses. Could drones also be outfitted with foldable arms and legs so uh, it flies to a certain point and then walks the rest of the way? Yeah, there's, a, in fact, one of the hobbyist drone companies has a, a drone that has wheels on it and it can fly and roll, and then there are also ones that uh, can also be on the surface of water. Yeah. So all kinds of things are going to be explored, yeah. I'm pretty sure. If going into burning buildings, locating where people are? Totally, yep. So do you think this is really going to change the quality of life for the better? I mean, some people say too much technology uh, might make humans obsolete. It might seem to devaluate human life in some way. You know, I think there's a risk of that. I think that these technologies are going to cause us to rethink what is the, the role of, of, of humanity. And I, I'm hopeful that it will cause us to focus more on the things that make us most human and allow the technology to handle a lot of the things which are kind of dehumanizing or more mechanical. Because I know there are some people who are very devoted to machines and they want to replace certain of their own body parts with mechanical parts, so they're sort of partially robotized. I mean, is, I mean, is that a healthy trend, do you think? Well, certainly somebody who's lost a limb, having a, a, a replacement mechanical limb that works well, wonderful, mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, In that case, there's a need for There's it. a need, yeah. There are a certain part of the, the population that, uh, you know, would like to be 10 feet tall, would like to uh, experiment mm -hmm. with themselves. And uh, I think most of the population has a little bit of queasiness about that if it goes too far, particularly if you're, if you're 
you know, editing the genome. That's sort of one of the mm -hmm. hot things right now. And so I think that's an ethical, moral issue that humanity as a whole is really going to have to address. To what extent does modifying our you know, innate natural human form, to what extent is that a good thing and to yeah. what extent is it a bad we're thing? We're tampering with something that maybe we're not the true owners of. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to change pace a little because there's another subject I'd like to discuss. You're also very knowledgeable about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency, and this ties into the other things we've been discussing as well. In fact, I think we have a slide showing some actual Bitcoins. Can we see that? And there are some actual Bitcoins. And of course, these are not really actual Bitcoins because there is no such thing as a physical Bitcoin. A Bitcoin is just a bunch of uh, bits in a computer. Exactly, yeah. Bitcoin is an amazing technology invented in 2008 by somebody who used the name Satoshi Nakamoto, though it's a pseudonym, and nobody knows who actually invented it. And it's having quite an impact, both as a currency of a sort, but more intellectually, it's opening people's ideas up to how the, the future economy might be very different than the current economy. Well, it's an interesting concept with money because money is usually thought of as something you can touch. In fact, we have another slide showing different types of money that have been used throughout the ages. So uh, people have used cows for money, they've used seashells, they've used little pieces of paper with pictures on them, they've used gold discs, that's probably the most durable source of money. But here's a source of money which is backed up by nothing and which only exists as uh, magnetic bits. And its only value is in the fact that people agree that they are going to regard it as being worth something. Yeah. I mean, the reality is that all forms of money are like that. Like, people think gold is somehow intrinsically valuable. We were talking a little earlier, there's actually a quadrillion tons of gold at the center of the Earth. And yet, somehow, because that's not accessible, uh, you know, the very rare gold that's on the surface of the Earth somehow has very great value to us. And so, the whole notion of what it means to carry value, in some mm -hmm. sense, what money really is, is it's a contract that allows somebody to transfer value to somebody else over space and over time. Something that everybody will recognize has value to them, a universal medium of exchange. Exactly. So now how does Bitcoin work with that? I mean, how do you get Bitcoins? Well, so there's a complex uh, cryptographic technology that underlies it. The key underneath Bitcoin is something called the blockchain. And what this is, is it's a big ledger that's decentralized. It's copied all over the world uh, by these uh, entities called Bitcoin miners. And whenever there's a transaction, like I send some Bitcoin from me to you, that gets recorded on the blockchain. And there's this process by which that recording happens so that everybody in the world agrees, even though they don't know one another and they don't trust one another. That's the reason I'm so interested in this technology, because it enables uh, entities which don't necessarily trust one another to interact, to make agreements, and to really uh, work together. And that's, I think, what we need for the AI systems of the future. And copies of this blockchain exist in many different places, and they're all identical to each other? Yes. Um, the way it works is there are these Bitcoin miners that solve these uh, computationally expensive puzzles in order to have the right to add the next block onto the blockchain. The reason they do it is that they get paid they get paid in, block, uh, in Bitcoin. Do you have to solve these problems yourself or just allow your computer resources to be used for somebody else to run a program on it? You allow your computer to do it. And though the, the hardness of the problems, it gets harder and harder so that a block is added to the blockchain about every 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of way it's designed. And it used to be that you could do this Bitcoin mining on your laptop and make a lot of money. Uh, then people started building faster and faster machines. Today, most of the miners are these special purpose hardware, and a lot of them are in China, interestingly enough. And here it takes a huge amount of electricity. Yeah. That's and that's expensive too. $600 million of electricity yeah. right now. Now, some people are actually speculating in Bitcoins. They're uh, buying and selling Bitcoins the way you buy and sell stocks and hope that'll go up. In fact, we have one more slide which shows the graph of how Bitcoin has... So there's the slide. And it shows that for a long time, which it might be hard to read the numbers there, but it looks like it started around 2009. It was worth next to zero. And then it went up to about $100 or $200, fell back, reached a high of over $1,000 for one Bitcoin. And now it's slipped back to somewhere in the 200s, I think. Yeah. But does this reflect on the validity of Bitcoin, the fact that this is so volatile? or? Or is this a sideshow to the real importance of Bitcoin? It's a sideshow, though it really does sort of show the nature of financial markets. 
Um, when I first heard about Bitcoin, you know, pretty soon after it was announced, and I was thinking, oh, probably around 2009, 2010, maybe I should buy some of this stuff. Well, I recently looked. If I had bought $10,000 worth then, today it would have been worth $180 million. Wow. So kind of regretful that I didn't buy it, but some people did, and there were these Bitcoin millionaires. Mm -hmm. So other people hear about this, and they say, well, I want to get in on that. And then people start buying it, not because of its intrinsic value or because they want to use it, but because they think somebody else will buy it for more right. later. And that's the, the, the resources, that's what, what you need to get a bubble. So we had pretty clearly a financial bubble there. Yeah. And then it eventually crashed. So the thing is, you have to know when to sell. If you're trying to speculate. I, yeah. you know, in some sense, that's a sideshow to the true technology, which uh, enables uh, people who don't know one another and don't trust one another mm -hmm. to interact. That's where the real uh, power is. So the underlying technology of Bitcoin is not just money. It's uh, a technology that enables you to verify all kinds of things. Yes, and there's some new kind of Bitcoin 2.0 projects, probably the most advanced is called Ethereum, which uses a similar underlying technology to enable any kind of a contract to be uh, put on the blockchain, something they call smart contracts. And once that launches in the next month or so, uh, we should expect to see a whole range of societal functions moving into this kind of decentralized technology. Is there any possibility that the whole internet could suddenly collapse and wipe out all of these coins? Like if somebody had an electromagnetic surge or something that uh, caused a huge... In other words, we're getting a little too dependent, uh, putting too many of our eggs in one basket by being totally reliant. Well, I mean, bits. the internet right now is a pretty shaky foundation. I mean, we just, every, every week we hear about more security holes and uh, systems being broken and so on. And so I think our current internet infrastructure needs to be upgraded to higher security. I think Bitcoin, the Bitcoin technology, so far the, the basic underlying technology has not failed. There have been some big failures at the ends, the, the people who are holding Bitcoins for other people in what are called wallets. Mm -hmm. Some of those have been broken into and there have been some great heartache. But I'd, I'd love to con uh, continue this conversation, but I've gotten the signal we're out of time, so we're oh, all going to okay. have to wrap. I've been speaking with Steve Omohundro, who has worn many hats, uh, expert on robotics and artificial intelligence and drones and Bitcoin. Steve, thanks for coming. Always a pleasure to see you. Thank you for watching. Visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman. We'll see you next time.